Hello and welcome back everyone. Um, I'm really excited to kick off our next uh, session here at the MetaScience 2021 conference. Um, our topic today is on forecasting scientific outcomes and we have four amazing speakers that are, we're going to hear from today. Um, the format, just to kind of lay this out for the audience so you know what to expect, uh, we're going to go through each of the four uh, speakers first, we have about 15 minutes to kind of give their backgrounds, all very different approaches at, at tackling this really important and emerging area. Then we'll be able to save the rest of that time for moderated Q&A. So as I've seen with all the other uh, uh, discussions and talks that we've had today, please add your questions into the Q&A as you have them when they come up, and I'll manage that at the end. So please add as much as you can there, and hopefully we run out of time and that can spill over into a further discussion on Remo and other aspects. So since we want to maximize our time, I say we jump right into this. So our very first speaker today is uh, Eva Vivalt, who is an assistant professor of economics at the University of Toronto. So Eva, go ahead and feel free to share your screen. Okay, uh, let me just, can you all see this? Great. Thanks so much for having me here. It's really a pleasure. Um, this is a huge topic and it's especially nice to be presenting with so many other people working in the same area. Okay, so today I'm focusing on uh, using uses of forecasts in research and I'll be drawing upon experiences with the social science prediction platform. And in particular, I will try to just go through some reasons why somebody might want to collect forecasts of their research results and uh, tell you a bit more about how the social science prediction platform is actually currently being used by researchers. So roughly speaking, I'm going to highlight these five general kinds of reasons. This is not an exhaustive list, but I would like to argue that Collecting forecasts of research results can help in evaluating the novelty and credibility of research results, in helping in the long run to mitigate publication bias against null results, can help us answer substantive research questions such as about belief updating, um, or provide prior observation analysis. And finally, they can even be useful in experimental design. So let me just say a little bit more about these, but I also want to flag if you're interested in this topic, uh, some of these are taken from a uh, policy forum piece in science that Stefano de la Vigna, Devin Pope and I uh, wrote a couple years ago now. Okay, uh, but I think these actually go beyond that a bit. So evaluating the novelty and credibility of research results. How many of us, probably all of us, have been in seminars, you're presenting and somebody says, yes, but we knew that already. <laughs> or you're uh, refereeing and you, uh, again, get the critique, well, you know, what does this really add to the literature? Um, so gathering ex ante forecasts can really help um, in um, addressing this kind of critique especially since people are, as we know, subject to hindsight bias. Ex post, everything is obvious. So you really need to gather forecasts ex ante. Um, and yet I would also argue there's a subtle trade-off between novelty and credibility uh, that a lot of people don't recognize. Um, and by this, I mean, you know, if you think of a really surprising result, that really surprising result might also be less likely to replicate in the future. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm not taking a side here in terms of uh, there's a double edged sword. I'm just sort of pointing out there is a bit of a tension here. So, um, you know, there's many, many uses of them, and um, th these are both two of them potentially. <laughs> Um, another way that people may like to use forecasts is um, to really help to mitigate publication bias. So as we all know, significant results are so much more likely to be published than null results where the uh, null is zero, okay? Um, and yet if you gather some ex ante forecasts and that zero result was surprising, then that makes it a bit more interesting. Um, and, you know, you can think that there's sort of theoretical reasons to um, really be wanting to test against what 
um, sort of the current status quo um, expert opinion is, rather than testing always against zero or, or, or against whatever, you know, other specific um, alternative hypothesis you've got, like, why not use the forecast as a null? Um, all that said, again, I want to caution a little bit that uh, if everybody sort of goes down this route, you could see over time uh, increasing slant in publication bias towards surprising results rather than null results. Um, but um, nonetheless, it might still be a little bit more intuitive to compare against the current status quo. And people have been using them to answer substantive research questions. So here's this example from Advani et al, which is on the platform. Um, do people know what share of articles in economics are published on race related research topics? And they also have political science here and sociology. And so these are box plots uh, that show the distribution of forecasts. And then those black lines are the actual true value. So they ask people to essentially uh, predict summary stats, predict what share of articles were on race related research topics the way they defined it. Um, I've also got some work with Aidan Kobo where we ask policymakers how they update their beliefs in response to new evidence. And again, for that, you kind of need priors. <laughs> you can't get belief updating without priors. Um, similarly, Bayesian analysis really critically depends on priors. The question is always which priors and having to defend a choice. Um, and I would argue that expert forecasts is one principled approach uh, to selecting those priors. Uh, and Yakovone et al. have a forthcoming uh, JDE registered report um, that compares uh, Bayesian and frequentist impact evaluation methods, and they explicitly gathered priors for this Bayesian analysis. And then in terms of experimental design, I mean, imagine that you are the UK nudge unit and you want to study police retention, but you've got 10 different kinds of things you can test. Um, you can only run a few of them, so you can only run three of them. Which treatment arms do you run? Um, or you can think of this in the context of replication. Should you replicate that paper? <laughs> um, and yet I would say this is, you know, important to people, even if you don't have many, many treatment arms, you know, that's a common uh, response is, hey, I don't have that kind of freedom. I'm evaluating one thing. How is this useful to me? And I would still say, look, this is still useful to you because you always have a choice about the outcomes. Um, how many survey rounds you do, which questions you ask, how many times you ask those questions or you know, how many rounds of data are you gathering uh, for your repeated measurements. Uh, you can always think of priors as a potentially useful input to your power calculations. Now, of course, there's a big literature on forecasts and we're really lucky because there's so many other people uh, here today talking about, uh, you know, basically the, if you look at the bullet point three DARPA score, everybody is here. <laughs> um, so that's fantastic. Um, but there have been really a huge growth in people collecting forecasts, individual research projects, collecting forecasts for their own um, study. And it was out of this that uh, Stefano Della Vigna and I decided to uh, create this social science prediction platform, which is a centralized platform to forecast research results in the social sciences. Um, what is being forecast? Well, uh, they can be summary stats like the mean or full distributions of priors uh, from each forecaster. The forecasters uh, mostly are other researchers, but they can be policymakers, they can be members of the general public. It's really pretty open to the researchers. So as you can imagine, this is a pretty big endeavor. Uh, here is the team. And um, the platform offers several advantages. So it's nice to be able to coordinate learning about forecasts. So gathering them in one place like this, um, we can a little bit mitigate the public goods problem in that um, you know you don't want to have a lot of people writing emails to hundreds of people trying to get them to forecast their own study that would not be sustainable so it coordinates a little bit but also allows us to look um, across different projects and since it allows tracking of forecasters over time it gives us a panel so you know we can identify super forecasters <laughs> um, also, the platform provides third party certification of when the forecasts were gathered and when they were made available. This can be useful if, for example, you want to um, 
plausibly, very credibly say, look, I gathered the forecasts when I didn't even have data yet, when I had no way of biasing the questions that were, were asked there. Um, and even you can choose when they're made available to you, because again, you can say, well, um, you know, they were made available only after I did the pre-analysis plan or something like that. So again, you're binding your hands, so you can argue that the analysis is kind of blind to the forecasts, um, if you want. It's an option. Um, and the platform also, of course, just by coordinating, makes it easier for researchers to collect and use forecasts. We've got, you know, templates and such, um, and the you know, survey pool, essentially. And it makes it easier for forecasters to provide and learn from forecasts. Um, I'll give you a little example of that. Uh, at the end of that study I was telling you earlier by Advania Dole and those race-related uh, papers, this was the distribution uh, um, th of the of the values that people estimated for the share. You can see the true result that they entered, the black line. Uh, the response mean is the green line. And you can see, you know, my response. This isn't actually mine, but you know, you can see my response <laughs> there. Okay. To say a little bit more about types of priors, we really have been leaving this open to the researchers that have been eliciting forecasts. So this can be results from uh, field experiments or lab experiments. Um, it can also be, though, summary statistics, um, and this includes uh, pretty notably first stages or even estimates of model accuracy. Um, so first stages, think of things here like, you know, your take up rate of a program. You want to know the overall effect of the program, but that's obviously going to be influenced by what the take up rate is. So you maybe first have that as your first stage. Um, so uh, Actually, if you look at what people are getting forecast on the social science prediction platform, surprisingly to me, people are often asking for summary statistics, um, important summary statistics. And this is even like after uh, uh, segmenting out the first stage there, which also is pretty popular. Um, so it's, it's about equal share of summary stats and treatment effects. Um, so that's actually pretty interesting. Um, who are the forecasters? Well, we leave that open to the researchers using the platform. So oftentimes people will want forecasts from other researchers to sort of see what the discipline thinks of a certain issue, right? Um, but sometimes they can be policymakers. Uh, some of my work with Aidan Kobo, we've uh, surveyed policymakers. Um, many others have as well. And uh, sometimes you may want to get forecasts from people like your program beneficiaries, see what they think, see if they can um, predict what's going to happen. Not necessarily people in you know, your treatment group or your control group or your study, but people like them at least, okay? Um, so um, you can certainly do that. Now in total, we've currently got over 2000 registered users, uh, but that's sort of the registered users, right? And there's many more people who actually just sort of take one survey, never, fully sign up. Um, they were invited to one particular thing, say. Um, but uh, yeah. Now, of those researchers who created a profile, here is the distribution. So you can see it's, you know, it's still dominated by economics. Uh, but we haven't really done much in the way of uh, outreach to other disciplines, really, apart from like word of mouth and such. So uh, certainly, there's much more growth to be had there. But also, it's just interesting that we've actually had a lot of interest, 40% participation from other disciplines, uh, sort of despite that. Um, so if you're in another discipline not seen here, yes, you are welcome to use this. Um, it's for any kind of you know, social science. Um, and then in terms of within economics, um, forecasters fields, well, they're again a mix, uh, mostly various kinds of um, you know, applied micro behavioral development. Um, there's a mix, okay? <laughs> um, of course, again, we don't have these data on anonymous users. In terms of incentives, again, we leave this up to the researchers who are eliciting forecasts. Everything is really geared towards making this something that researchers can use valuably in their own um, uh, studies. So we allow both incentivized and unincentivized studies. Um, if it's incentivized, the researchers then pay their own respondents. Um, we're also working on building in more public recognition of um, good forecasters. So um, in the near term future, there will be a leaderboard uh, that you can sort of see how well people have been doing. And just uh, to give a bit more background, 
the way this typically works, a researcher will design a study, collect baseline data if they are going to do that, use that to then inform their forecasting survey. Oftentimes in your survey, you want to have some kind of baseline stats or something to make it more concrete. Um, and then you send that to the online platform. The platform distributes the, the survey. You know, you as a researcher go off, you gather your results data. And whenever you pre-specified that you would want those forecasting survey results to come back to you, and it could be immediately, it could be like, you know, as soon as they come in, you sort of watch them come in. Um, whenever that is, those results are released back to you. And then when you have study results, you upload them to the platform and those are released back automatically to all the other forecasters. So this is also nice, like whenever you've got, you know, in some IRB thing, you say, well, I'm going to share results back with the participants at the end of the study, this helps, right? <laughs> um, so this is the general flow, but then this is just a typical flow. There are deviations. So say you wanted to use this for um, designing your experiment in the first place, well, then obviously you're going to want to get the forecasts first, um, right? Okay. So there's multiple distribution options. We've got our own pool. You can get them sort of passively from people who go to the website. Um, you can use personalized email links to target certain groups. Um, and you can make different sort of subsets of these, right? Uh, so you can have multiple versions, multiple, you definitely can track, you know, where people are coming from. And uh, you can also distribute it, of course, through an anonymous link. So here is the site. Uh, I hope you check it out. I hope it can improve uh, social science in the long run. And uh, there's the URL and contact info for more. Wonderful. Thank you. That was that's great. Um, and I know there's uh, more that we could go to there. Actually, we're going to switch. Like we said, we're going to hear from everyone else. Again, everybody keep thinking through the questions that you have, because I think uh, we'll come back together. And thank you also for forecasting the fact that, yes, we have other panelists here that are doing some of these exciting projects that you mentioned, like SCORE. And one of those is uh, Fiona Fiddler, who is a professor um, at the University of Melbourne, uh, split between the School of Biosciences and the School of Historical and Philosophical Studies. Mm -hmm. um, and so also is coming here very early in the morning for us. So thank you. Hope you got your coffee and go ahead, take it away. I didn't get coffee. My coffee machine's broken. It's a disaster. Um, and Eva's talk was so clear and well paced. And, um, and this one may not be. So we'll see how we go. Um, I'm talking today about the Replicats project. So the CATS part of this acronym stands for Collaborative Assessment for Trustworthy Science. And this is a big project. Here's our wonderful team that um, is that is running as part of the DARPA score program and in fact all of the talks that follow me in this session will also be referring to the DARPA score program so I'll talk a little bit about what that is I'll talk through our structured elicitation protocol in replicates our platform our community um, the mathematical aggregation that we're using so one feature of replicates is that whilst it is sort of a structured deliberation process and not unlike a, a Delphi process, we rely not on behavioural consensus, but instead mathematical aggregation of individual judgments. We'll talk a little bit um, about prediction accuracy in our pilot and preliminary results. And then I just want to spend a couple of sec uh, minutes talking about where this project is going beyond just forecasting replicability, which has been the primary focus so far, and how we might use something like this structured deliberation protocol to kind of reimagine how peer review works. So uh, there are two there are new acronyms on every slide here. I'm sorry about that. So DARPA is, of course, the research agency of the US Department of Defense and SCORE stands for Systemizing Confidence in Open Research Evidence. So this is a very large program that has three what they call um, technical aspects. And the first technical aspect is actually coordinating the ground truth or the replication studies. This is run by the Centre for Open Science. They're doing a lot of other things for this project as well, but that's the will be my focus today. Technical aspect two is where the Replicats project sits. And this is about eliciting expert predictions about the outcomes of um, hypothetical replication studies. So Unimail Replicats, that's us. There was a second team in the first phase of this 
program in this technical aspect called Replication Markets. And Anna, who is speaking after me, will talk a little bit about that, amongst other things. And the third technical aspect is really sort of the blue sky part of this program, which is um, about using machine learning and AI to develop algorithms that can make these kinds of predictions about replicability and other features of credibility to basically assign confidence scores to, to the published literature. And Sarah, who is talking after Anna, will be talking about that aspect of the program. Okay, so most of what I'm going to talk about today is what we did in the Replicats project in phase one, which ran um, until the end of, about the end of last year. And in that first phase, we elicited predictions about the replicability of 3,000 published articles, articles that were published in 62 journals across eight different social science disciplines, um, business, criminology, economics, education, political science, psychology, public administration and sociology, all of these articles were quantitative articles and were not yet up to looking at qualitative research. And we did this um, by relying on uh, an amazingly diverse and dedicated pool of participants. We've had now, um, now in our second phase of the project, this 550 is actually about 700 participants from more than 40 countries across eight of these domains. And I can see in the attendee list that um, a, lot, a number of them are here today. So thanks. <laughs> and we've run a combination of face-to-face -face workshops at conferences, of course, over the last 18 months, that's moved to online and remote elicitation. And we've had partnerships with various e, um, early career researcher journal clubs, most notably the reproducibility journal clubs. And for each of these 3,000 articles, we've had between four and six assessors um, assess uh, the primary research claim of the article. So this has given us a, a huge amount of data of thousands of individual quantitative judgments and um, and explanations and justifications of those quantitative judgments. So we're also, we're listening quantitative judgments, but also kind of reasoning and justifications that sit alongside that, which I'll explain a little bit more. Now, so our elicitation method here is, is not a prediction market. Anna will be talking about prediction markets. Ours is a structured deliberation protocol. So it's co closely related to a Delphi model but with some clear differences. So um, participants first make some private first round uh, judgments about the claim that they're assessing. They then share those judgments with other members of their group and they have a discussion. And this is a facilitated discussion um, where group members are encouraged to interrogate each other's judgments, to um, share information. The, the point of the discussion is not to reach a consensus. It's um, to think about counterfactuals and um, explore new ideas. After the discussion, participants make a second round or updated set of private estimates, which we then mathematically aggregate using a number of different aggregation models. So the important difference um, here, the important thing to remember about this is that it's not a consensus, it's not a model that focuses on consensus. In fact, we encourage um, disagreement and um, new ideas in discussion. So then we put all of this protocol together in a custom built platform. So you can see on this side, you have inf on the left side, you have information about the article, including a link to the full text of the article, some summary of the results. And then in the middle pane, in the first round, participants are answering questions. What you're seeing here is a view from the discussion round where participants can see each other's interval judgments. So the question in the middle of the screen here is what is the probability that direct replications of this study would find a statistically significant effect in the same direction as the original study? Um, so here you have 
answers from six different participants, sorry, five different participants. You can see their interval judgments. So you've got information about how certain they are about that probability judgment. And then on the final pane are their comments, the, re the reasoning and the justifications for those quantitative judgments that they're given. So our platform has um, is user driven, it's interactive, it's social, there's opportunity for our assessors to get feedback and calibration. So they get to compare how their, um, how their judgments stack up against others. And uh, this, this process we think is intrinsically rewarding. We've also added some kind of gamification, little badges that participants get along the way, which um, they seem to like. Uh, here in, this is a picture of what our community dashboard on the platform looks like. And importantly, the badges, um, here's some more. The badges, some of them count up how many claims people have assessed, how many articles they have assessed. But importantly, we also reward badges for the types of behaviours that we want to encourage. So participants can, um, can earn a badge by looking in the glossary to check out terms. Or they can earn badges for interacting with other participants' um, comments and reasoning. So these are supposed, these badges are designed to encourage the sorts of behaviours that we want to um, encourage. So our Replicats community, we have we have aimed to recruit for diversity. So as I said, we now have 650 active participants from 40 different countries. They are predominantly um, PhD students or early postdocs, early to mid career researchers. And, um, but we do also have some professors across, across the whole spectrum of the disciplines that we're interested in and even some people outside those disciplines. And one thing we've noticed over the course of the workshops that we have run during this project is that there is a real community, the capacity building aspect to this, that this process that we've developed not only elicits predictions about replicability, but is functioning essentially as deliberate practice for peer review. So particularly our early career researchers have um, have felt benefits from this and, and have returned to our workshops a number of times to, for this aspect, for this kind of training in peer review, the ability to get feedback and calibrate their, their assessments against other people's. Uh, as I've mentioned, we're interested, uh, the way that we deal with these individual responses, the way we turn this into a decision, is by mathematical aggregation, not by any kind of behavioural consensus through discussion. So I want to talk now about some of the models that we're using to do this. So what you see in our platform here, what's fed back to participants is a simple unweighted mean of their responses. And that's, that's sufficient, we think, for this feedback part of the process. But when we are when we are aggregating the final judgments, we use um, a series, we have a whole suite of aggregation models that we're looking at, 22 of them, in fact. Now, I'm not going to talk about um, each, you'll be relieved to hear that I'm not going to talk about each of these in turn, but there are three basic categories of aggregation models that we're working with. So the first red box up the top here are basically different, different versions of um, arithmetic means, weight or, uh, and medians. The final box down the bottom is Bayesian models. And the box in the middle is what I'm going to spend the most time talking about today. These are models that have weighted judgments by um, various proxies for performance. So obviously, we don't know beforehand. One of the very difficult things about forecasting is trying to judge 
beforehand who is going to be a good forecaster. And we know from lots of previous research that traditional measures of expertise, number of publications, years of experience, turn out to be not very good indicators of prediction accuracy. So we've set about a project of trying to find other things that will be better proxies for performance. So some of the things that we've been exploring in these models are informativeness, which we operationalise by the interval width of participants' judgments, so we can weight more heavily judgments that express a lot of certainty and downweight ones where, where the intervals are very wide. Um, we have a proxy that's basically prior knowledge. So we give participants a quiz before they start these workshops, asking them various statistical and methodological questions, and we can weight by performance on that quiz. Um, we can weight by how extreme or how asymmetric estimates are. We've had a theory that um, perhaps more extreme or asymmetric estimates were indicators of, of more information. So that's a theory that we've been able to test. We can weight by uh, open-mindedness, so whether participants, um, how much they shift their judgments between round one and round two, if we think open-mindedness or integrating new information is likely to be a proxy for good performance, and we can weight by engagement, the, you know, the amount of time they spend on the platform, the number of words they write, and we can weight by reasoning. So because we are collecting those uh, open-ended justifications and reasoning responses from people, we can qualitatively analyse those and use those to weight people's, um, use those as a, as a proxy, weighting proxy. So here's an example of some of the things that we've done. So we, in some of these um, aggregation models, we've, as I've said, we've weighted by um, interval width or um, asymmetry, so whether the best, someone's best estimate is just in the centre of the interval or whether it's off to the side. And um, we can do various transformations on means and so on. Uh, we can, as I said, we can wait by openness to changing your mind, by prior knowledge, so performance on that quiz. Um, we can wait, we ask people a comprehensive uh, comprehension question as part of the elicitation and we can wait by, by that, by their self-rated understanding of the paper. So, oh, there's a little funny thing on my slide. Um, so now I want to talk through just quickly some of our pilot and preliminary results, our accuracy results. So how well this elicitation model we're using is performing. This, is, this data is from a pilot study that we did. So this is, um, this is data from, we took 25 studies. These were studies not from the SCORE program corpus. This is 25 studies that had already been replicated in previous replication projects. And we um, asked uh, five of our participant groups to go through the regular replicates protocol to assess these and um, and our classification, what we've called here classification accuracy using the simple unweighted mean for these studies was, was 84%. So um, by classification accuracy, I mean, if the, if participants said that the replication study would be statistically significant in the same direction as the original study, and then it turned out to be that case, then that would be an accurate classification. So this is a just a small pilot that we did, and the results are up on Meta Archive. Um, and I'm turning now to the accuracy, the preliminary accuracy from our phase one score results. So what we see here, um, uh, what we see here is all of our different 22 aggregation methods along this x-axis and on the y-axis is an accuracy measure called AUC, area under a curve. And this is the primary accuracy measure that's being used as part of the score program. And there's quite a lot of variation as you can see between the 22 
aggregation models that we've used, some of the things that we thought would do really well, like openness to changing your mind, how much people shift between round one and round two, turns out to actually be the worst possible aggregation model in this set. Um, our, best, our best models were the ones that relied on reasoning, um, our reasoning analysis. And I'll talk a little bit more um, about how we did that reasoning analysis in a moment. But basically these, these two relied on that reasoning, weighted participants' judgments by how many independent reasons and justifications they gave for their quantitative judgments. And in that case, our AUC was 0.78 and our class classification accuracy was around 74%. Another accuracy measure that we can look at here is Briar score, which is a proper scoring rule. And our Briar score here falls below 0.2. Okay, so this is another view of the same results. So what we're looking at in this table is um, comparing our predictions against 50 replication outcomes. So the first 50 replication outcomes provided to us. And we were looking again for a target value of a target AUC value of 0.7. So here in this table are our 22 aggregation methods again, and you can see that um, the first 18 of them uh, meet that target AUC of, of 0.7 and, and then there are a few that don't. And same as in the figure before, it's the reasoning ones that, the ones that wait by reasoning that sit at the top of that. In this next table, we're adding some different kinds of replication studies. So not just direct replication studies, but also some data analytic replication. So replication studies that look that use pre-existing data sets to addressing the same question and some computational reproductions. And when we sort of expand the definition of replication to include those things, our accuracy drops off pretty dramatically. Um, as does the accuracy of most other methods, I believe. But we still have, um, but what we do see is that those, those models that wait by reasoning um, stay at the top of the list. Okay, so now I just want to talk a little bit about what this reasoning, what these reasoning models are. So basically to create these models, we take the open-ended comments, the justification that our participants provide on the platform or in their discussions, and, um, and we qualitatively code this. So um, here's an example of a participant's comment and um, of the reasoning codes that would have been, that were associated with this particular comment. So each of these boxes counts as um, an independent reason that this participant has given for their particular quantitative judgment about likely replicability. Um, sometimes they talk about other credibility aspects, not just replicability. So they'll refer to generalizability or inference validity and so on. And these also get coded as independent justifications. So in the end, we can build up a reasoning code book. Um, this is an early version of our code book. It's quite a comprehensive list of reasons that participants give for these judgments. And we can use these different categories of judgments, the number of these different categories of judgments to weight, um, to weight our aggregations. So that's, that's how we've, that's kind of a summary of what we've done in phase one. We're now in phase two of the SCORE program where we're kind of moving beyond forecasting replicability and looking at other credibility dimensions. So in this phase, we're evaluating a suite of credibility signals, including transparency, robustness, validity, generalizability, and gathering overall credibility ratings from participants about the paper as a whole. Um, we're, or there's another difference in what we're doing in phase two as well. So first of all, we're not just assessing replicability, we're looking at this suite of credibility signals. And we're also looking at um, uh, the entire, an entire research paper more holistically, rather than just having people assess the replicability of a, of a single claim. 
So there's a suite of signals and we're also looking at the, at the whole network of claims within a paper. So it's a far more challenging exercise. Um, so I just want to take this last minute now to, to kind of talk about how we might use something like this st structured elicitation protocol um, in peer review. So a peer review is essentially, you know, if we, if we think about this, peer review is, is essentially a, a group elicitation, deliberation and decision exercise. And um, at the moment, our traditional peer review protocols re, um, elicit unstructured narratives that are often subjectively aggregated by a single editor, often without transparency or oversight. Uh, there are some ex existing models of interactive reviews, and we see these at frontier journals and um, and other, and other journals, including eLife as well. But many of these, not all of them, but many of these interactive models um, do rely on some kind of consensus formation technique. And often this is consensus without a defined endpoint, which essentially means it's consensus by fatigue. It's whichever reviewer gives up first, the, the other one wins. Um, in our protocol, we feel like we, we think we've overcome many of these obstacles. We have an inherently collaborative and intrinsically rewarding protocol. So we talk about external rewards for peer review often, but this is a process that actually provides intrinsic rewards as well, has inbuilt training for reviewers and calibration. It's not driven by behavioral consensus, has a defined in, end point. We get out of this quantitative judgments and qualitative reasoning, and it encourages reviewers to interrogate each other. And it offers transparency around the aggregation process. You can access a demo of our platform if you're interested um, on our resources page, uh, on our replicates page at the University of Melbourne. Okay, thanks very much. Wonderful, thanks Fiona. Really exciting to see the progress that's that's uh, been occurring uh, throughout the entire uh, program that we've been working together on. All right, we're going to go to our next speaker. Keep us moving along. So very excited here to have, and again, swing into time zone entirely the other direction. So very late at night. So thank you. So we have Anna uh, Draber here, who's a professor of economics at the Stockholm School of Economics. So go right ahead. Great, thanks so much. I'm super happy to be here. Thanks to the organizers and super interesting talk so far and looking forward to yours, Sarah. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about work that is joined with, whoops, lots of people. So here's the list of the co-authors that have been involved in the projects that I will now talk about. So there, they are many and they played super important roles. And if there are a couple that I can highlight, it would be Thomas Pfeiffer, who's a computational biologist at Massey University in New Zealand. So it's early. Friday morning for him, and I think he's here. And the other person is Magnus Johannesson, who's an economist here in Stockholm. And I, I'm guessing that he's sleeping at this hour. Okay, so we have been doing these projects where we've uh, been looking at prediction markets in science and whether we can use prediction markets to try to predict in particular replication outcomes, but increasingly also novel hypotheses. So then you might be wondering what are prediction markets? So prediction markets are basically these um, tools to aggregate information. You want to understand what types of beliefs people have about something. Prediction markets can be one such tool. So they've been used quite extensively to predict outcomes related to politics, uh, entertainment, sports, and other types of events. And um, here's an example from a, a, a political uh, prediction market. So in this particular market, you could uh, bet on who would win the 2008 US presidential election. Uh, the two main candidates are Obama and McCain. Uh, a contract in Obama is worth $1 if he becomes president and $0 if he does not become president. So the, the price for this type of contract can be interpreted as the probability that the market assigns the event. So the probability that the market thinks Obama will win uh, the election. If you think that the probability is higher than this price, so higher than 91.5%, you should buy this contract, go long in it. And if you think the probability is short is lower, you should go short in it, short sell it or buy the opponent's contract. 
So the potentially good thing about prediction markets are that you're not asking people who do, who would you vote for, who do you want to win, but you're asking people who do you think will win. So potentially you can aggregate a lot more information here because I'm just I'm not gonna be betting here just according to who I want to win, but according to what I believe. And these are things that are functions of uh, what I hear, read, and see. So potentially this is a way to aggregate a lot more information than say an election poll. And there are many studies comparing prediction markets to election polls. And the markets typically perform as good uh, or better than uh, polls, but not always. But we're not interested in election polls. We're interested in uh, using these types of markets uh, to try to predict uh, replication outcomes. So in these uh, studies, um, we basically linked prediction markets to uh, uh, replication projects. Uh, and I will go into details and tell you more which ones in particular. So the main thing we're asking people to predict is this simple, uh, simple, it's a binary event. Um, basically whether the replication result will be an effect in the same direction as the original study uh, that will be statistically significant in a two-sided test, yes or no. So a binary event for better and for worse. Um, so we open these markets up for 10 days to two weeks. We invite people to participate. People are typically researchers. Maybe some of you have participated, and thanks if so. Uh, in these markets, we've had between 30 and 200 participants at uh, each time. And when you enter these markets, let's say there are 20 or 25 studies you can bet on. So you bet on whether a study will replicate, yes or no. You don't have to bet on all of them. You can choose and self-select into those markets or studies which you're interested in. So when we have 30 to 200 participants, that doesn't mean that we have 200 participants betting on each particular uh, study. There are studies that many people are interested in and studies that fewer people are interested in, in, in uh, trying to predict for various reasons. So we are not asking people to put their own money on the table. Uh, we're giving them 50 to 100 US dollars each that they can then use to trade on these um, uh, replications. And we recruit researchers mainly through uh, email lists, uh, replication projects, uh, and similar things. Okay, so um, the, the main replication projects that we've been collaborating with in various ways are the big replication project in psychology, the reproducibility project, uh, where we ran prediction markets for a subset of the 100 replications. So we have replication outcomes, and prediction market prices and surveys that I will also mention soon uh, for 41 out of the RPP studies. We also added prediction markets to the Many Labs 2 and Many Labs 5 projects, which gives us another 24 plus 20 replication outcomes and predictions. Um, we performed replications and also uh, predicted replication outcomes for experimental economics. Uh, here we looked at 18 studies. Uh, from two top econ journals for a time period of 2011 to 2014. We replicate these studies and we try to predict replication outcomes. Uh, we also did a project, again, joined with many people where we tried to replicate nature and science studies published between 2010 and 2015. Here we replicated 21 studies and we tried to predict uh, replication outcomes in various ways. So in these markets, there is this one central hypothesis for each study. So that's the one that is being replicated and that's the one that we're trying uh, to predict. So in these markets, participants uh, are trading contracts that similar to what I described earlier, pay $1 if the study replicates successfully according to the definition, which typically is that we find an effect in the same direction as the original study. And this effect is statistically significant. If the study does not uh, replicate according to this definition, the payoff from this uh, contract is zero dollars. So we interpret the price of these contracts as the prob predicted probability of the outcome occurring. So the predicted probability of the study replicating. Uh, some details that may not be super interesting, but we use a logarithmic scoring rule. So this means that we are the counterparty to trade with in the sense that you don't have to find someone else to take the opposite side of the bet. We, we, are the, we are the counterparty. We allow for both long and short selling. So if you enter these markets, um, you think that the probability that a study will replicate is higher than the current price. Okay, you should go long in the contract and, and buy it. 
if you think the probability is lower than the current price, you can short sell the contract. Before participants uh, bet in these markets, we give them typically replication reports. And I would say the um, sort of the further we've done replication projects, the more information they get. Um, so these replication reports detail uh, what the original result is like, what we're planning to do with the replication, and uh, how these things differ. And that's, I mean, that's mainly when we've been doing the replications ourselves, and maybe we've given them slightly less information than in projects where others have been doing the replications. Uh, we start prices at 50 in these markets, and then prices can go up to 100 or down to zero, depending on how people are betting. So depending on what people uh, are thinking or believing about replication outcomes. So here's uh, uh, an interface from our experimental economics markets. So you have the studies and they are summarized by basically author names, journal and the year of publication. Uh, you see the current price, which will vary between zero and one and the higher the price, the higher the probability uh, this, that the study will replicate successfully according to the market. Uh, so if you, you can have sh shares, of course, in these uh, markets, in these studies. Uh, and if you click on a particular one, you can look at how prices have been changing uh, over time. And then you can choose to go long or go short uh, in this particular study. Okay, so before participants enter the market, we ask them, in a pre-market survey, how likely do you think it is that this hypothesis will be replicated? And we define what we mean by uh, replication outcome here. And we typically ask something about how well participants know the topic. So we know something about their level of expertise. And that's a variable that typically doesn't help us at all in uh, predicting results. Okay, so what are the results? So here I'm showing you 123 replications for which we have replication outcomes, we have uh, prediction market prices, and we have these survey beliefs. So I'm thinking about the work that we're doing with uh, uh, Thomas Pfeiffer, Felix Holzmeister and, Holzmeister and others, Michael Gordon, that we're basically adding more and more data to these projects. Uh, so to sort of update these figures with uh, more information. So right now, this is the current situation, and this is uh, summarized in a forthcoming paper by Nosek et al. Um, so in the simplest type of analysis here, we basically say that if the price or prediction market price is above 50, or if survey beliefs are above 50, the market or the survey thinks that the study will replicate. And if prices are below 50 and or survey beliefs are below 50, that means that the study uh, markets or survey participants do not think that the study will replicate. In black here, in this, in solid dots, we have successful replications, meaning that uh, the replication finds an effect in the same direction as the original study, typically uh, statistically significant at P less than 0.05 in a two-sided test. And from just looking at these figures, you can see that there are two more uh, solid dots above 50 than below and more non-solid dots below 50 than above. But uh, with this, in this, this type of analysis, we find that when we pull these prediction market studies, we find that there is some wisdom of crowd going on, but it's far from perfect. But there is something going on, so there is, seems to be something systematic about results that successfully replicate versus fail to replicate. And the markets are pretty, but not perfectly good at uh, picking this up. So in this uh, paper that I mentioned by Nosek et al, um, we also show how prediction markets uh, perform relative to machine learning models trying to predict the same outcomes. So these are from three machine learning papers that came out recently. And uh, if, so these results suggest that the, uh, these machine learning models, they perform pretty well, but they do not perform better than the prediction markets. They perform equally well or worse, but that's likely to change once there is more data and probably more training data, et cetera. So, I think Sarah can tell us more about that soon. Okay, so when it comes to the DARPA score markets, here I played a super tiny role. So the person to talk to is uh, Thomas Pfeiffer, who is in the audience, so maybe he can jump in if there are questions on this. But uh, as Fiona was saying, there were many studies to be predicted here. So we set up uh, prediction markets for 3,000 studies 
um, and accuracy is then being evaluated on a subset of these because all of these 3000 studies are not actually replicated. So what the results suggest so far uh, is that per performance is not very good. I mean, it seems to be better than random forecast, but it's far from great. And it's less accurate than in our previous smaller projects that, that I just showed you. Um, and if anything, people are better at forecasting within their own field compared to other fields. Um, so the biggest problem with these markets that we experienced was that there was very little trading. In our previous projects, we had researchers who participated for a limited amount of time for a limited amount of uh, papers to predict. Here, there were many papers over a long period of time, and very few people stayed on and uh, predicted papers uh, repeatedly. And uh, yeah, so thin markets were the biggest, was the biggest problem in these studies. So now we're moving on to other types of um, forecasting. So we're still trying to predict replication outcomes, but also new hypotheses. And the focus in most of our current projects are more on effect sizes, so not on, just on this binary, will it replicate yes or no, according to uh, a specific definition. So we're mainly looking at researchers forecasting. So similarly to the prediction markets that I described earlier, compared to the uh, DARPA score prediction markets, we typically have some small monetary incentives in these uh, uh, studies. But there is small and there's not much evidence for, from our studies suggesting that they actually matter. But being an economist and talking to economists, I have to convince economists that what we do makes sense. And then small monetary incentives are better than no incentives, for sure. We also typically give um, participants in our new forecasting studies consortium co-authorship. So uh, when we ask participants to try to predict outcomes, that typically means that they will do a lot of work. So many, many hours of going through material and actually uh, looking at exactly how the research design will be like, what are the instructions to participants, et cetera, and then try to predict what's gonna happen in the studies. So we've decided to uh, use consortium co-authorship in order to reward uh, these forecasters. And I think that makes sense given the amount of work that they have to, uh, extend but um, yeah some people might disagree here and these projects overall i would say that we typically find these fairly strong positive correlations between beliefs uh, forecasts and what we actually find for both uh, direct replications conceptual replications and new hypotheses but of course not perfect uh, correlations between beliefs and actual results and lots of this is joint work with um, Eric Goodman, who's at INSEAD Singapore. So no idea whether he's awake at this hour. He should be, but I don't know. Okay, so I'll skip going into details about that. And I want to end by talking about our new project, which is about to be launched. So perhaps if you're interested, please participate. So when we're thinking about replications, and I mean, I'm in the world where we, we try to do some uh, smaller replication projects, so not like the RPP, but more like the experimental economics replication project or the nature and science uh, replication project. There are just so many potential replications to be run. So what should we actually be replicating? So um, instead of us just using some decision rule like time period or specific journals uh, with some method, we are basically now thinking about how we can use markets to help us decide which uh, replications to run. So we have chosen, after having gone through all PNAS papers using uh, MTurk experiments during a longer time period, or a few years of time, uh, time period, we ended up with 41 PNAS papers that we can potentially replicate in the sense that we have software instructions, et cetera. We don't want to replicate all of them. We want to replicate 26 out of these. Which 26 will that be? That will be a function of, predict, of, of the market prices. So these will not be prediction markets, but they will be decision markets. So depending on uh, final prices, that will affect what we will actually replicate. So all of these 41 studies have a positive probability of being picked for replication, but not all of them will be. And some will get extra weight in sort of the lottery for being picked. And which ones will that be? That will depend on our decision rule. So we can use a decision rule where we are the most interested in results in uh, replications where uh, 
for studies where markets have prices closest to 50 because the information value would be the highest from uh, replicating those studies. Or we can go for studies that are the most likely to be false positive results according to the markets or something else. So this is very much work in progress, um, but the markets are uh, hopefully opening on November 1st. So we'll start advertising the markets on uh, October 1st. So please participate if you are interested and just send me an email or if you want to talk about any of this at some other point or collaborate or just say what you're annoyed about, just send me an email and thanks a lot. And that's it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to keep moving along here, and then we'll open up for questions at the end. Um, so our next and last uh, speaker here is Sarah Reitmeyer, who's an assistant professor in College of Information Sciences and Technology at the Pennsylvania uh, State University. So Sarah, you should be able to share your screen if you want and go right ahead. All right. Does that look okay? Looks good. Um, thanks, everybody. Uh, thank you, Tim. I'm really glad to be part of this discussion. Um, I will talk about some work also part of the DARPA score effort and uh, Fiona really nicely illustrated the three task areas and pinpointed where we sit in the third task area, which is sort of looking to, to develop um, machine learning algorithms to uh, score confidence in published claims. Um, so our effort um, is called synthetic prediction markets. Um, we are using bot traders uh, within these artificial markets to determine experimental reproducibility. Um, our team is large. I've listed some of the key um, personnel on this slide. We are spread across four universities, Penn State, Texas A&M, Old Dominion, and Rutgers. Um, the team is mostly computer scientists, applied mathematician, and economists. Um, and I also want to note that within the, the task areas that Fiona outlined, um, we are one of three teams in the third task area. So another team is led by two six labs, um, and another is led by um, researchers at USC. Um, both are taking different approaches. Um, both based on knowledge graphs. But I will focus on, on this um, approach, which uh, actually was nicely, um, sort of the, the, the groundwork for this was nicely laid um, by Anna's talk. We were very much motivated by the success of the prediction markets that Anna described. Um, they work well to predict replication outcomes. Um, or they work pretty well, but they're time and resource intensive um, and they are subject to some limitations with respect to just the um, scope of um, information available to the participants and maybe some biases that they could bring. Um, so when we proposed this in 2018 um, to the DARPA solicitation, there had not been these papers um, trying machine learning models for the task. Um, but what we, we knew is that the machine learning model we wanted to create um, and that DARPA was asking for had to have some key characteristics. So um, we knew that we would not have a lot of training data, so to speak. Um, and so we did not want a data hungry model, um, which we've sort of accomplished and um, are sort of still struggling with. And another thing is we wanted to have a generalizable machine learning approach. So we know that the, um, the scientific literature is changing quickly and we wanted to be able to score new claims that might come in that might be pretty different from what um, the previous training data had looked like. And thirdly, and really critically, um, DARPA was asking for explainable approaches. And so we know there's a lot of work in explainable AI, some of um, that is on our team, but we really wanted something that we could output sort of human understandable um, explanations for the scores we come up with. And I think um, as this project moves forward, I realize that's even more important than I realized at the beginning, because when you look at the kinds of nuance that is brought to the table from, for example, the replicates um, surveys, 
it's not just one score. It's not just will it replicate its generalizability and robustness and many other nuances that are really important beyond a single score. And so um, at this point, you know, our explanations are our best ways of trying to give insight into that in a purely machine learning model. Our approach, again, motivated by the success of the human populated markets, um, was to develop a fully synthetic prediction market. And this is what we prototyped in phase one. So the TA3 teams uh, started a bit after the TA1 and TA2 teams. Um, and we, so we're um, about two years in to the project. The first year and a half was phase one, which we, um, basically this is the pipeline. Um, it's a little, it's a little complicated, but we start with a PDF and we extract what we can from the PDF. So I would say half of our effort is in feature extraction and half of it is in the actual AI. And it's still a really important question for us whether we're extracting the right features. Um, and I'll get more to that on the next slide. Once we've extracted these features, we provide those features as information to our agents or our bot traders. And our agents use the information that they have to determine whether they would like to purchase contracts representing a will re reproduce or will not reproduce asset. Um, and we iterate the market for some time, and I'll discuss that as well. Theoretically, the market converges um, in a purely theoretical world. But at the end or at the close of the market, we have uh, a spot price for the will reproduce asset, which we take to be our score, our confidence score. And we also have a few different ways that we assess our confidence in our confidence score. Um, at the bottom of this schematic are these orange arrows and the orange arrows are the training process. So in the beginning, we did not have any data from the replicates or the replication markets. Those were the two TA2 teams. And we used um, known replication projects like the ones Anna described. But we also used other signals that were very imperfect, but we thought might have some signal for reproducibility. So we used papers that have been retracted from the Retraction Watch database. We also used papers that had been pre-registered um, and, and a few other things. And we use these to train our agents um, basically using an evolutionary genetic algorithm where agents that did poorly um, were pruned from the system. What we're moving to now are um, hybrid prediction markets. So this is something I'm really excited about um, in our approach. And that is in the winter, we'll have human participants participating alongside our bot um, traders. Okay, so I'm animating here with some uh, human beings in this loop, so you can see where they um, where where they, where they will be. Um, but you know, there's a lot of open questions, and I think a lot of interesting opportunities um, for for fundamental and like also um, just very practical research in this regard. First, we want to see whether including humans in the loop improves the performance of our markets. Also, we want to be able to train our markets with human participants occasionally, um, but be able to deploy them offline. So one of the requirements for the TA3 teams from DARPA is that we are able to assess a claim within 30 minutes. Um, so we can actually do, run these um, human uh, participant hybrid markets um, in 30 minutes, of course, but we pitched this idea that maybe we can do it every couple months or every now and then, the actual appropriate timing of that, we don't know, and then um, deploy our system in a fully synthetic fashion um, offline. And a couple challenges we hope we can also address using this approach, one is we have a lack of agent participation. So it does sound sort of mind blowing because you would think we have control of these agents. Um, and you know the same issues that come up with lack of participation in human prediction markets 
um, we are facing, and I'll, I'll describe those a little bit too. And we're also hoping that this will allow us to have some signal for unusual new claims. So when we have a test point that's far from our training points, maybe the signals of allowing uh, human experts in where we need them can help us um, kickstart the system. Larger, I think, questions just from the AI community is, you know, how can we maybe capture the best of both worlds here? Is there any way that our agents could capture some of the human intuition, the wisdom that the experts bring to the markets? Um, of course, while our agents have sort of an unparalleled view over the whole literature, um, which, which it could be a, a really wonderful combination. Also, um, just to make, to make our lives more interesting, DARPA threw at us a few months ago this idea that maybe we could um, have a Turing test of sorts, which we found super exciting. So uh, ideally, our hybrid prediction markets would give us the opportunity to understand um, how human-like our agents are. Challenges that we uh, face or we need to address are um, a few. So we need to make sure that when we incorporate our humans into our prediction markets, that we can disentangle some of the effects that may be occurring um, due to the hybrid setting. We also are now determining what we should show humans. So we show our agents the features that we've extracted from our papers. Um, it's not clear that we should show the human participants those features in that form or just let them um, read the papers themselves. We're also worried about reintroducing some of the biases that we had designed the synthetic system to skirt. And we're also worried about retaining the explainability of our assertions. So um, again, one of our main motivations for this approach was that we thought the trade logs um, could be used um, and sort of wound back to be an explanation of the system outcome. When we introduce human participants, of course, um, we have to think about how we would explain their interactions and their effects on our eventual scores. The features are really important. So like I said, um, we have to make sure that what we're extracting from the papers and what we're providing to our bot traders is the right information and it's meaningful. In the first phase of our work, we started with um, a lot of um, feature features at the paper level. So these are things like um, author related features or bibliometric features, co-authorship networks, things like that. Um, and there were also statistical features about the um, number of uh, the sample size and the p-values and so forth that we extracted. Um, but the kinds of things that the, the experts, human experts would look for in the text are, are features that were not really represented in our system. What we're trying to do to sanity check our features is we're trying to say, okay, if our system is performing well or not well, how much do we attribute that to the features and how much do we attribute that to the market, the AI? So where, what is the source of success and failure? And the way that we've tried to do that, to print, in principle assess that is to have a red team. So the team within our team, um, the sub team at Texas A&M um, uses the exact same features and we don't really interface with them. We really wanted to keep them. So they share the features, but they assess all of the papers that we assess with our market using a different just baseline machine learning approach. Um, it's a baseline machine learning approach, but it's actually super sophisticated, um, uh, interpretable machine learning approach. They're at the moment using something called a neural structured data regressor. And I have to say that at the moment, the red team is outperforming us um, as well as in our latest evaluation, all of the other TA3 teams. Um, so it's a really tough baseline, but very interesting for us because um, we can really see whether it's the features that or the market that's determining our performance. 
we are starting to integrate more features with a particular focus on claim level features. So you may have noticed when um, Fiona was discussing the TA2 effort, they're assessing what's called bushel claims. So rather than looking at just the single um, primary claim of a research paper, the TA2 teams are now assessing the uh, multiple claims in a single paper. And if we, using our approach, are to evaluate multiple claims in a single paper and give them different scores, we really need to make sure that we have rich features at the claim level and not just features that represent the whole paper. Um, and so we're working um, to do that. And we've also started to collaborate with um, the other two TA3 teams who have very sophisticated um, uh, feature extractors for some of the language around the claims themselves. The market itself um, is a, a synthetic market using a simple binary option. So will reproduce, won't reproduce according to some established um, definition of what that means and also using a logarithmic scoring rule. Um, the agents themselves are located in high dimensional feature space and essentially they um, will buy an asset of will reproduce or won't reproduce based on uh, the location of the test claim and whether it's in their um, region in feature space. At the moment we're using um, ellipsoids so uh, we are also looking to expand these regions to convex cones for more generalizability. Um, what you see with the animation is that these regions in feature space where the agents will bid uh, are time varying and based on the price. So as you can see, as the red um, regions are growing, the blue regions are shrinking. So um, red being will not reproduce. And as the market price for will reproduce goes down, the agents are more likely to buy an asset or, or the space around them where they um, will be willing to purchase an asset increases. Um, in a purely theoretical form, and this uh, is the paper that I linked, um, at the bottom of the slide, we have proven some things that are sort of mathematically interesting about the market as it is modeled with an ODE. In practice, we make some modifications to this, so it's not really as neat and um, provably clean as in the formulation in our paper. Um, so, for example, we only allow an individual agent to purchase one kind of asset, either a will reproduce or won't reproduce, they specialize. Um, not all agents can bid at every round, they get called up randomly, and these are things that we're still uh, experimenting with. Um, when we think about evaluating multiple claims per paper, on top of the question of um, the features that we would need to extract that are specific to the individual claims, we also have to think about how we would want to evaluate them in the market. So we could just take each claim and just evaluate it separately and forget all of the dependencies of whether they're in the same paper or not, or if they are within the same paper, if one might have been dependent in some way on another. Um, but we're now looking at combinatorial markets and other ways that we could preserve some of the meaning and the dependencies amongst the claims in a given paper. The training of our bots um, uses an evolutionary algorithm um, during the training process. Um, so um, agents that perform well um, are kept and they can replicate and evolve. Agents that are per perform poorly are deleted. So far, um, we have uh, different ways of assessing ourselves. So we, we initially assessed our market on the known replication projects, so the RPP, the SSRP, EERP, many labs, many labs too. These are the projects that Anna mentioned. So in a total of 192 papers, what you'll notice is something very, very unique um, to our market, which I could, I could try to argue is a good thing, but it's very non-standard in machine learning, which is that we did not score, we our, our algorithm only scored 35% of the papers. So essentially what happens is agents can choose to purchase an asset or will reproduce or will not reproduce, but if they don't choose to participate, then they don't choose to participate and we have no information. So with that, um, 
example, when we train, uh, uh, and I think we split it 80, 20 or something like that, five-fold cross-validation, what we found was that um, in 65 approximately percent of the papers, our agents just didn't bid and they just didn't have enough information. Um, however, in the papers that they did bid, we did really well. So um, binarizing the outcomes, like just they whether they correctly assessed um, that the whether the price was over 0.5, so they would reproduce or under 0.5 would not reproduce, um, we had 90% accuracy. Um, what we do see, sort of a ray of hope, oh, and this is um, incorrect on the slide, it was a copy paste, but when we evaluate ourselves against the TA2 data, 2,400% of the papers, the system scores over 50%. So this system score 68 of 192 is just what was above, but I don't have the exact number, but it's over 50%. So it's still half only of the papers, but our um, we attribute this to the additional training data. So um, we, we know that more training data allows our system to assess more um, test points and more agents to participate, but actively, um, and we know that when our agents do participate, we do very well. Um, but the question of how we can meaningfully incentivize agents to participate or how we can allow our agents to better generalize is an open question. We have a UI um, and we're doing some usability testing. Um, so the prototype system is essentially a, a dashboard. You can upload a PDF. Um, our feature extraction pipeline extracts features and uh, those features get passed to our synthetic market. And um, the number of agents participating, um, the distribution of the purchase shares, what you know, the um, price of a will reproduce asset over the iterations of the market um, are all displayed. We also have um, so with respect to explainability, we do this in four in four levels. So the first is just what was the the value of the asset, but then we also aggregate information about how many agents participated, and where they were in feature space. So the agents, as you might have noticed from the um, the animation on a previous on the previous slide, agents are all located in different spots in feature space so they care about different things so what we do is we output for the agents that did um, participate in the market what features did they care about um, and how many shares did they buy and so forth and at what price um, and so that is sort of our ex ex way of explanation at this moment we have been working with um, the RAND and MITRE, as well as some DOD stakeholders to see how useful this system is, what do stakeholders really want, and early takeaways are that the features, so the explanations, the features that we, we can point to that were behind the agent participation are more useful than the scores themselves, and I think that that um, makes a lot of sense at this point, and so um, remains a focus for us to better understand our explainability as we move forward. We are receiving some explanations from the Replicats team as well. And so what we would like to do is compare the kinds of explanations of our system that we can um, output from the market to the kinds of explanations that we, we get from TA2. I'm gonna stop there. I have a couple of papers linked um, and uh, wanna thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you, Sarah. Um, and uh, I'm just recognizing the time here, so um, there's a couple of questions I've been I've been itching to ask, and I know that there's been a lot in the chat, which is great. Um, but I was wondering if I could ask one last question. So we have seven minutes left with each other before we go, and it's to go a little bit farther. I think I'm going to use Fiona's phrase, "blue sky." So there's these amazing platforms you guys are developing, each of you. There's the ways you've been pushing the boundaries of what we know. I'm curious if each of you just like a minute, minute and a half is about all the time we have, like want to go and go say like, where do you see this? Where do you see, you know, forecasting these prediction markets, synthetic or human landing and influencing the way that we do science today and the way that we kind of consume that 
and being as broad as you want, right? Science is a very agnostic tool that everyone uses. Um, so if you're okay with that super broad question, maybe we'll follow the same order if that's right. So I'm gonna put you on the spot, um, Eva, if that's okay. Okay, great. Um, so I, I guess I would say two quick things, and this is having, you know, not thought about very long. So, but um, I would say first in terms of changing, you know, the way we do science, I would say a big thing is, well, how is this going to be used in papers? How are editors going to think about it? How are people going to refer to forecasts when they're reading a paper to try to, you know, figure out what the starting point is? Um, and then the second thing I would say, apart from how it changes the interpretation of results, um, in the long, long run, and we're nowhere near that right now, I do hope that people start to look at forecasts more in the absence of proper data from, a, you know, RCT or whatnot. Like, I do think that, um, you know, there are loads of situations where we don't have all of the information that we would want to make a decision when we have very limited evidence, and it would be a shame to put absolutely zero weight on forecasts. Um, so I hope that we learn enough about when people are getting it right to be able to start to debias it and start to use it as a non-zero source of information. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks. Yeah, it's like a tool or another thing in the toolbox that we should be using. Uh, Fiona, uh, do you want to give us your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I sort of did already talking about how this might be how something like a replicas protocol, for example, might be integrated in peer review. And we're actually starting a, our first kind of proof of concept trial of that with a journal next month where we're going to attempt to use this in the wild you know for reviews in real time on real papers so we'll see how that goes i can perhaps re report back on that next year or something but um but aside from that one of the things that i'm really excited about is actually something that eva mentioned in her talk and that is a feature of the social science platform that she's been talking about, which is using these kinds of predictions to form judgments of prior probabilities so that they become incorporated, a natural part of how we practice science and incorporate it in the models that we produce. Excellent, thank you. Anna, you wanna take a, a shot? Yeah, so, I mean, a bit inspired by what Eva and Fiona have already said and what Sarah said earlier. So I guess we wanna figure out how we can get as good predictions as possible, be it with surveys or markets or the replicates format or artificial markets, whatever it is. And then I think we should add them to the peer review process, similar to what Fiona has been saying. I mean, I've been asking a few editors about, hey, what about having prediction market as the fourth reviewer? Because uh, I think the peer review process is a small end problem to a large extent, but to no luck so far, but maybe one day there will be, who knows? Um, and then like uh, as similar to what I was saying about the decision markets as some tool to choose what to do, how, what to replicate, what studies should we be running? If there is disagreement, can we use uh, markets help us deciding where to go forward? Something on those lines. Excellent, yeah. Sarah, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this, especially since it's a, a broader tool that, that can get dispersed quite if applicable kind of a fast, a lot faster than the, the human approaches. I think um, there's a lot of promise and I think it's obviously, I'm, I'm someone who loves machine learning and I like algorithms and all of it, but I actually do worry that taken out of context, it's just, we don't have enough signal. None of these approaches are doing that really well right now, honestly. And I think the problem is so, nuanced so difficult that like I think you know I'm seeing more and more that whatever we output as a single score um probably doesn't tell the whole story and I worry about outliers and I worry about you know even an algorithm is doing I'm so proud of our 90 percent on our little subset but that still leaves 10 percent behind you know and I think um these are these are, this is research and these are researchers and so we want to be sure that we're, we're it's equitable what's what what our system's outputting um so i think having it be a piece um and one other piece of information that we can use um is is critical 
Excellent. Yeah, I think uh, all of you are, are saying kind of the same thing, right? It's this really exciting potential. Um, start to get it into the wild, start to continue to test it, start to see where the boundaries are. There's a lot of the questions that, that I saw that was being asked in the Q&A, and I wish we had more time. Uh, I think this is a really exciting topic, and it'll be really exciting to see, uh, you know, next year, the year after that, kind of where all of this is going, because it sounds like there's some really exciting work that you guys are all doing. Um, so I'll finish, since we're out of time, <laughs> to say thank you again. Uh, thank you a lot for your time, uh, for your insight, and thank you to the audience for the questions and engagement. Thanks, Thank team. you.